station you must be interested in history history mystery and bees thank you for showing up and suiting up and traveling with us as we explore the world of bees from the time they arrived on a shooting star to a recent journey they took to outer space i'm laura b and my fellow cosmonaut and explorer is andrew golf and today we're going to talk about ancient city named chattel hayek Everybody, welcome to Bees in Space. I'm Laura B. And I'm Andrew Goff. And today we're going to talk about our journey to a very special place in central Turkey called Çatalhöyük. And a really uh, wonderful site that Andrew and I both visited separately. And uh, But first we want to do a new little mini segment that um, we'd like to bring in Bees in Space a little bit. An actual Bees in Space, things that are happening right now. In, in a time. And so we've been finding little different things about bees and space. And it's actually a big. There we go. And the first is this group of um, this group of young women named Nova, Aaron, Sky, and Sarah, who were from a bunch of different high schools in, in Illinois. And they thought about an experiment to send. Um, bees into space to see how they operate in low gravity situations. So they went to the space shuttle, all, I mean, the space station. All of the previous experiments have been on moving shuttles and so forth. Um, next slide. And they were able to do this because of these different programs for young uh, women in space, like the STEM program. And the species that they sent up there is this little leaf cutter bee. So it's a, not a honey bee, but it's a solitary bee that um, will emerge and mate and pollinate um, from these little individual tubes that they make out of uh, alfalfa. Um, so they, the results haven't been released yet. I don't know why, but they're still, I guess, under review. But these girls were very excited. They didn't actually create the experiment. They worked with another program to create the experiment. But um, yeah, they, they that's did the it. Little, the that's the cute little bee. That's the leaf cutter bee. Isn't she just cute? It might be a boy, but darling, darling little thing. So, but let's go back to our travel log. What do you think? You want to do your... Yeah, um, I can't wait to dive in. And you know, the thing about Chattel Hewick or Chattel Hoyek, whoever I talk to says it differently. So I, I say it differently every time I, I speak of it, but it's such an amazing place, right? And for me, it's where the goddess emerges. So, you know, where is it? Well, we have a map here of Turkey and we can kind of see Turkey embedded in the ancient world, uh, you know, right across the, the pond from Greece and, and not far from Iraq and, and Syria and Armenia and all these amazing places, right? Then up on top here, I've kind of highlighted, well, where Çatalhöyük is, but also just how close it is to Gobekli Tepe um, and Gobekli Tepe. Uh, you know, what's interesting to me is Gobekli Tepe is the only place on the planet where kind of scholars agree that's the oldest temple in the world. Chatelhoek is, is the oldest city in the world by agreement. Now, I think both of those are, are blown out of the water by forbidden archaeology because the, the planet's 4.5 billion years old. You can't tell me this civilization started 10,000 years ago. I'm just not going to buy it. But 
it's interesting to see that it's this whole area is 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 really really sacred. Just south of Gobekli Tepe is Haran with the beehive huts, and then you're in Syria. So just to kind of set the scene for where we're at when we're making this um, this journey. And you know, for uh, the uh, the listeners, we should probably say, we, uh, uh, Laura, you and I agree on a subject, and then we all kind of compile some material and share it uh, on the day. And so there's no sort of view as to exactly what you're going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about, until we do. So it's going to be you know rather spontaneous, and I, I think we're going to have some similar photos, but but that's okay because it's just a spectacular place. Yeah, and, and I think we each have such a different perspective coming in um, that our experiences are going to have this nice little flavor change, you know? Yeah, and I, I took a peek, a peek of uh, at your slides and I was like, oh, wow, now that's really cool. That's really cool. So at the end of your slides, I've got some slides that were inspired by, by what you're going to show. And I think we both have this image. Um, and what I love of this image is you're looking down on... The, the very place where these incredible early images of the goddess uh, began to emerge. And, you know, not much is left of it today, right? Unlike Gobekli Tepe, which was bubble wrapped and protected, this place has been open to the elements for a, a very, very, very long time. And, and it shows. One of the things though, so you remember that last image where I was, looking down into the, uh, the remains of the old city. This is what they find on the most sacred temple wall in all of Chatelhoyuk is a honeycomb beehive design. So that's almost 9,000 years old. Mm. You know, and you think, okay, well, that's, that's a one-off. Um, maybe it was something else. Well, at the same time in Australia, Aboriginal Australia, We've got the same thing. I wondered, I saw that slide that you showed up in the upper right and I thought it was the one down below. That's wonderful. Well, and, and it gets even more interesting because this is around the same time, but let's come forward. Well, we think we're coming forward. We can't believe anything history has told us in terms of chronology because, well, it's, 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 you know, whatever they've wanted to tell us, they can tell us. And we know intuitively, and we're not stupid. We can see a diamond cut uh, stones in Egypt and Peru. And we know that there were advanced technologies and more ancient races than we're led to believe. But look at Malta, the hypogeum, the same thing. That really looks like B cells. And, and, and so we, we find this all across the ancient world, which is so interesting, but, but just kind of bringing it back to the Chattel Hewitt, we have also this, this artist's rendering of, of another temple. And there, there's, there's bull symbolism everywhere. And, and like you shared at the outset, we'll do a whole episode on bulls and bees because it really blows your mind how they're interrelated. But for me, and you know, I'll come back to this when you're sharing uh, some of your really cool slides that, that kind of show the dancing goddess image. It's not just the symbolism of the bull for me, it's, mm. it's the horns, it's the, that shape of uh, an Irman soul, that shape of the horns of consecration, which, are all about protection uh, in the ancient world. Um, so protection, honeycomb beehive designs, it's you know, already a very alluring place for the world's oldest city. Absolutely. And of course, you know, where I was standing, you were standing, uh, Rebecca was standing, looking down in the remains of the city. This is where they found, you know, these earliest images of of Cabelli and flanked by two lions and the fact that Cabelli is always flanked by two lions is is so interesting and come back to that because lions were a, a very uh, sacred animal in the Bronze Age but 
it, there's, there's something there that we've forgotten. Does it have to do with Leo? Is it, is it about a constellation? Is it about the goddess moving through the sky, bees in space? I did some looking into this particular piece, or this particular style of the Cabele, Cabele um, model. And what I found, there, the excavations really started in the early 60s, and then they stopped for a long time and started back up again in 1993, and then were stopped again in around 2017, 2018, because the current cultural attitude in Turkey is that the old stuff isn't so cool, and Erdogan doesn't really want to uh, work with some of the other nations that have been funding these explorations. But in the 60s and up in, and in the 90s, well, in the 90s in particular, they were really involving the local people, which was really exciting about this place. But what I wanted to say about this is, the guy that's been doing the main research right now, I'll talk about him later, but um, he said that these have been found in, this one in particular was found in a granary and yeah. then other ones are found in the garbage middens. So these her, historians are saying, oh, they must not have been very valuable. And I wanna say that on, on at a different way of looking at it, they're made quickly out of uh, mud, um, clay, and they're made quickly. And I believe they were used every year and that they needed and that they you they were they were thought of as not not sacred and therefore thrown away, but they finished their job and therefore need to just, you know, get it out of the house because we got to put a new one in there. There was a lot of these figures found. And I feel like they were a talisman. And yep. they're, they're, the fact that they were made out of cheap, reusable, quick materials does not decrease. In fact, it increases potentially the level of importance. Think about the Christian cross. You're finding that in every material from straw to plastic to stone. You know, so same with that. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say about it. No, it's, it's a great point because like uh, many homes, if not all homes had one, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was a really common image. And this isn't a um, Da Vinci quality design. It's exquisite, but it, it's something that I don't want to say a novice uh, artisan would have done. But you know what? Looking at this, you're going to think I'm really nuts. Um, I don't know how many times I've looked at this image and marvel at it but look at um starting with uh the uh, the breast and going down around the knees it's almost like that's a bull's head or a bee's face <laughs> or a bee's face exactly yeah, that's exactly. interesting well i think that the fact that they're made so quickly and so you know i think that there was an industry that everybody needed to make these maybe they made them as a village like let's all sit around and make these like or they're made with a press and finished by hand or some such technology um, that it was used constantly um, and consistently and was highly, highly valuable and highly important. I don't, just this really identification was look how fertile the mother is for us because when this was happening was right at the time when they were discovering Neolithic was the Neolithic revolution and they were just coming yeah. out of the Stone Age and into Bronze Age and discovering all this agricultural, including apicultural and animal husbandry and tending. So everything was lush. I mean, this is the Garden of Eden, really. Yeah, and, and, and when, when, we, when we talk about uh, bulls in the future, we'll talk about the bull's head, which was the graphical representation of the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, which had a value of 1,000, and 1,000 appears as a value of many things associated with bees. So it gets really, really murky, but I love that. I love that. And I love this, which is even older. So God knows how old really that, that last image was, right? You know, maybe 9,000 years old, according to conventional archaeology. But here's something archaeologists agree. It's 25,000 years old, a mother goddess who has morphed into a bee goddess because she's laden in honey. It's, it's, she's, she's orange and she has that headdress. And look at the size of it. I mean... Again, it's not, it's not a Da Vinci kind of Michael, Michelangelo uh, quality, but it, it's, it's the kind of thing that you could envision many households having because it's, like you said, it's a talisman. And I studied this uh, in many, many, many years ago. One of the qualities about them is they're all slightly different, but they all follow a specific formula. And the formula is based on a handful of clay. 
is that each person might take a handful of clay and they divide the pieces, one third here, one third here, divide that third into two and you have the legs, roll, you know, and then one third is the head and you pinch off the arms. And it's just like the whole thing is, is can be really specific to individuals. Um, and so it may be an individual talisman for an individual woman or an individual person and household. Like this isn't egalitarian. People think that the opposite of patriarchy is matriarchy. No, that's just the other, that's a flip side of patriarchy. The opposite of patriarchy is egalitarianism and this society was egalitarian. That's a great point, mm -hmm. great point. Get, I get a little speculative here, but I, I allow myself to do that once in a while. Well, one of the things that we see in, in Chattahuac is shamanic images, what appears to be shamanic images of hunters, for instance. And this is a hunter. If I was showing the full picture, he's kind of in this sort of state. And I argue that it could be the inspiration for the first ever halo because those are bees around his head. Uh, and we see similar images and I saw this and I, I'll, I'm looking forward to your your treatment of this image of uh, sort of a portrait of Chetlihuac by a, the residents of the of the town but also the volcano nearby and that's another loaded subject so how many great amazing um important civilizations have been founded near volcanoes, Pompeii, there's many of them. And, and you see on the volcano, uh, these, what is that? And what's above the volcano there? Uh, is that supposed to be erupting? Are those bees? I don't have the answer, but it's interesting how the artist has rendered it. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that same image later, but I believe you are onto something about the bees on that headdress. Plus, this motif is seen repeatedly in in historical things, and this particular character is a unique character among in that drawing. So, is this the person that was dreaming the hunt? Is this the person that is? the medicine person, because they did have medicine societies in Chattahoya. Uh, they, right. it was organized not in family structures, but in almost like um, in societies. And some of them were medicine societies, some of them were animal, uh, like animal clans. And um, so was there, so there may have been specialized, in fact, they did think that there might have been specialized individuals that did do medicine work. So is this the person? Because we see this in coins later in Gnosis. We see this in mm -hmm. other, um, and like you said, on the Venus of Willendorf, her head is the same. And, 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 and straight north from Chatelhua, going up to the Black Sea, directly north, you know, and not a super long ways either, you have the world's most famous hallucinogenic honey, which to this day, you, they can't sell the honey because it, it's just so hallucinogenic. I have and some. You <laughs> have some, well, you <laughs> must share it sometime. Um, but you can see where trading would be just so easy. And, 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 and thus the shamanic element that we all know is, is, is part of the, uh, the sacred bee. Absolutely. And kind of just moving quickly forward in time, people think that Sumerian uh, culture came sort of next, but no, this is Europe's oldest culture. This is uh, Serbia, Kosovo, and it's now believed that the Vincia culture predated Sumerian. And, you know, I'm going to ask, you're a beekeeper, I'm not, so you have a much higher resonance with images such as this? What, what, what do you get when you, you look at this image? It's tempting because of the face shape to want to say that it's bee-like, um, but the eyes really wouldn't be focused into the nose like that. They would be more on the side of the head and going up toward like coming like this. It would be like this, more like. Um, and also there's no room for antenna I mean, we don't see antenna in here, but it's really tempting because of all of this, all of this stuff that we're learning about um, the story of bees coming from outer space and all these different things that are related to these ancient myths 
that are so similar, like sound vibrations and pollination and fertility and the bees in the head. And, but I don't know, it's tempting. It's tempting. I'd like to see more. I'd like yeah. to see more of this character in its, in its symbolic um, rendering in situ. Well, and, and it's interesting because uh, the Occam's razor says, you know, bees with their um, honey, the medicinal, ritualistic, all the qualities associated with it from acupuncture to um, uh, bees wax, all that, right? So they're sacred for all those reasons. And that's what that is. For me, that's Occam's razor as opposed to it's an alien. Mm -hmm. Clearly it's an alien. So I'm not, I'm not dissing aliens, but I'm saying let's just keep in mind the heritage that, that we're kind of stepping through before jumping to, this is an image of an alien. And I know, I don't want to spoil this because we're going to do a proper treatment of this amazing, now we're in the Sumerian uh, era um, and, you know, in Anna, incredible, right? So I bring back this image of, 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 of Chatohoyak and a hunter, sort of bees on the head and that, that kind of shamanic state. And okay, he could be holding two bows. I get that. But what is she holding? Is there something similar here? The answer is, I don't know. But I just kind of like to toss that one out there because they both have a shamanic element to them, especially with her headdress. And who holds a bow by its string? The one well, in the right hand is being held by the string. The one in the left hand is being held by the bowing part, which would be the wood part if those were bows. So I'm 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 of the mindset that there's some mysterious connection. You know, that it could be a sound instrument. You know, it could be a shaking instrument, or you know, it could be some kind of like sistrum, like maybe. And one of the things, you know, what I mean, like it could be something that that we're just assuming it's a quote unquote hunting scene because patriarchy always talks about hunting and war and stuff. But um, could it be, you know, is there some other element to it? Like, could those be shakers of some sort? Um, like they have a um, bone, for example, maybe they have bone um, discs on it and they shake it, or maybe it's a whistling thing that you- Yes. Can, yes. You know, like we, we forget about sound. We're not talking ever about sound. Everybody's um, talking about this is an artifact. This is that this means this, but nobody ever talks like how do these people talk about sound, for example, when that we know as it's really important, um, you know, to the culture, you know, um, and all absolutely. And and you know, we, we have Athena, the hunter. We we have a Neith the, the, with the bow and arrow. So there's there's two prominent bee connections there. But I've also read that in ancient times when you wanted to stop the bees from swarming, you would go onto a hill, the nearest hill nearby, and pound a staff onto the, uh, the ground and make a certain noise that would instruct the bees, don't swarm. Oh yeah, there's a lot of stories about that. And, and uh, you can drum, you can pound on the box. Um, we have a, there's a gentleman in New York that actually does honey harvesting by drumming the bees out of the um, honey box. And, you know, so there's, you can use sound to move bees all the time. Um, and even there's ancient uh, Egyptian um, drawings that suggest that they're singing to the bees, saying something to the bees. So, um, but what I wanted to say is just because this is what we have left does not mean that's everything that's drawn on there. These are 9,000 years old. The pigments that survived were mineral yeah. pigments. Were there plant pigments? You know, were there other kinds of pigments that faded under the sunlight or that could not withstand, like lemon juice would withstand to a certain degree? I mean, I don't know if there's parts of it that are faded also, but um, I do like that how you connected those two references. Also notable that she has the lions at her feet and he has the leopard skin, um, yes. or he yeah. has the leopard skin um, skirt. And, 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 and just ever so quickly to go back to your, um, you know, really interesting point about sound and what we forget about sound, you have the sound of the queen bee piping. Uh, and, and what do you find in, in uh, um, Tutankhamun, whose death mask is a yellow and black horizontal stripe because he was the, the boy king, he was the bee king, his title was beekeeper. But the point is, the first ever trumpets make a sound almost identical to the queen bee piping. And trumpets have been used to pipe in queens and royalty ever since. So it's it's 
you know, were they were trumpets designed to emulate the sound of a queen bee piping? I don't know. We could definitely do a whole piece on sound. Sound, sound coming up. All right. I want to hear about your pilgrimage. Over to you. Well, let's go straight into it. Um, this is the first thing I saw when we went there and I went with Rebecca uh, Robertson, who is the director of um, the Melipona Project. Um, I'll say it right if you put it that are interested, but Rebecca brought me to a lot of these places. And the first thing I saw with Rebecca was Chattel Hayat. And something we didn't mention is that it is a stone's throw from Rumi's birthplace. So the landscape there is full of this beautiful Sufi consciousness and Sufi understanding of the world. And I can only say that that Sufism has emerged from that culture. I mean, it's an ancient, ancient, beautiful religion and it emerged from this area. So, you know, Rumi um, is inundated in this space. And uh, this is the, uh, I mentioned earlier in this presentation that in the nineties, they began to really develop um, the uh, program of excavation there. And a lot of and, uh, people from Turkey were working, men and women and children were working. And they did this uh, wall where everybody that volunteers gets to make a print and put it on the wall. Next. This is what it looked, this is what this image of the bull looked like um, back in the, uh, when they found it. This is an old image. And a lot of my images, not all of them, but about three or four images are from a YouTube video called History with Sai. Uh, and the video is called Chattel Hayek and the Dawn of Civilization, which I, it's just a little six minute video, but it had some great images I thought were worth saving. Um, so, um, but a lot of the images of the bull, people would have um, these handprints associated with it. And Andrew got me uh, onto thinking about um, the bull with this Cretan um, story, which I believe you're gonna share a slide of that later, as well as the Spanish um, bullfighting story. So this bull story is deep and rich. And if you know anything about bullfighting, it's a highly stylized sport. I mean, incredibly stylized. So uh, next slide. Well, I mean, I mean don't we it's so right. interesting. Look at the size of the bull compared right. to the people around it. Right. And, and, and so that's completely not to scale, I hope. Um, but what, what's, what is being conveyed there? Is it the, uh, the, the majesty of that incredible animal and its fertility and its uh, importance in their society? Yeah, when we, look at, when we look at the replication of this um, later, we'll see some uh, creatures that look like they're even both like doing um, bull tumbling as if this is a rite of passage. Also, you mentioned uh, the bull being potentially a reference to the concept of, of um, uh, earthquakes and riding the bull is like riding the earthquakes. And this is in a geologically uh, potentially unstable. I don't know if that uh, volcano was erupting around the, the time of, um, of the Chattel Hayek civilization. Um, active for about 2000 years. I don't know what was going on there. Um, or also it, what, what um, astrological cycle is happening then? Is it Taurus? I don't know, but yeah, yeah. could it be a reference to astrological, like, you know, like size, um, knowing of the self, because at this time, since they're expanding into agriculture, animal husbandry and apiculture, I'm assuming, um, they're, they're having more time to say, who are we? What are we coming from? What are we, what are, what's here? You know? Um, so are these all individuals that made their way through the rite of passage? And this represents the great rite of passage that men have to undergo of some sort, but I don't know. We still get to explore that in the bulls. We can't get distracted. <laughs> yes. Oh, what more bulls. Here's their rendition. Here is the copy of that um, redone so that you, we could see more clearly what it is. And I see that the man on there or the woman, the person on there is naked and, um, and their outfit looks like they're above the horns. So maybe you have to undergo this rite of passage to receive the leopard skin. And the bull's tongue is out. Sound. Ah! 
And, and, you know, in a lot of ancient cultures, like the Mayan culture where the, the, the kings would, would uh, have their tongue out, it was, it was representing tasting the sweet honey of uh, prosperity of their, of their kingdom. And, and here we have the bull with its tongue out. And it doesn't look like it's vicious, like it's going to bite somebody. It just looks like it's tasting. Or panting from exhaustion or making noise like the cosmic you know, um, this cosmic sound. Um, yes. Similar to the running of the bulls. We have a comment, um, similar to the running of the bulls. Yes. There. Yes. What about running the running of the bulls? Yeah. That's really an interesting comment. Well, and and, and I, I think, you know, the, the, uh, uh, just ever so quickly to delve into Mithraism, the most common image is cutting the bills, uh, the bull's throat, which represents, killing Taurus. We're passing from the age of Taurus into the age of Pisces. The bull is dead. And, and many places that were Mithra, um, where there was Mithra, a sun god worship, became bull rings in Spain. So they're still killing the bull. And now the, the, the bull run is just such a fascinating uh, comment because I, I don't think we really truly know it, its its origins but killing the bull would most certainly be a patriarchal um you know aspect because um societies that would be respecting this animal would not kill the bull they would you know unless it was like a ritual a ritual important sacred action of sacrifice so, you know i mean they were meat eater i mean these people ate a lot of meat they ate cattle sheep goats um, they found bones being cooked um, in their trash bin. So they did eat meat a lot. Um, but, you know, would it be, would it be a different relationship um, than actually, because we don't see in these images slaughtering. And, and yet in, in, in Egypt, the most elaborate um, burial chamber is for bulls, the Serapium. And there's written accounts of philosophers from 250 BCE that say, if you bury an ox in the sand and you cut off the horns of the ox, bees come forth out of the horns. This is my beautiful travel companion, Rebecca, who, um, and we're looking at, uh, we're going, walking through their beautiful museum and right off, I was, um, I immediately felt this kinship with our Native American um, civilizations mm. and the Pueblo peoples, whether it was the Anasazi or the more modern Pueblo peoples like the Hopi. And some of the early stories about that they came up in the 60s and then later in the 90s, they were saying, oh, the people would take their people's bodies and put them out on the hill and the vultures would devour you know, like that's the sky burial is something that people, Pueblo people um, in uh, North America do. Um, but that's been debunked. So there's a lot of things that have been debunked in modern stories. So anybody that's interested in Chattel Hayek, I invite you to look at the more modern um, science or more modern historians, but also challenge that history because obviously this guy is not thinking that one of the things that people used to say is why would they make a permanent civilization since they're not going to stay very long. Well, people can make permanent civilizations and can go out and forage and, and go on your journey and come home to your place and want to build a permanent structure because they're thinking intergenerationally. So there's perceptions and of the this place that are always going through a lens. But anyway, um, next slide. Hi, Rebecca. Um, while we were there, this little hummingbird moth was trying to pollinate that symbol. And I just thought that was really magical. And I had to share that. It's one of my very special power animals. And um, I just thought that was beautiful. Next slide. It's an amazing image. I know. I wish it was in focus. So this is from that YouTube. Um, this is an idea of what that civilization could look like. Again, early historians are saying that it was marshy, but they're finding out now through modern archaeological scientific methodology that it was not, that it was surrounded by farmland and was um, eventually, um, after 2000 years, was just farmed out. Um, one thing that should be noted is not only, they had a great sanitation system, there was about 5,000 to 8,000 people that would live in this um, at its peak heyday. Um, and 
Um, they, in between each of those buildings would be wall, the walls would have a space in between and they throw all their garbage in there, which, you know, so you can imagine what this place might, um, it might be a very pungent place. And, and uh, maybe one of the reasons why incense became popular <laughs> for the Middle East. Ah. Next slide. Oh. This is what the house would look like. And they would build these houses one on top of the other and they'd fill in each house and they would bury their people underneath the floors. And right. sometimes they would just bury their bodies and take their heads out and plaster their heads and carry their heads around with them from house to house. Um, and we might think that's really strange, but these folks I think really lived intergenerationally. And um, you will even see like an ancestor's head being carried around from house to house for generations and their body is left somewhere else. And, um, but then eventually that head is buried with somebody. So, you know, there's these relationships um, that they believe that these people were living and they would, they would dig up the bodies and then bury that level and then move to the next level and, um, and do it all over again. Um, the sky burial is not true. They found, they realized by examining these burials that they would simply bury the person under the floor, full, full flesh and wait. And then, and then when the next person died, they'd dig a hole next to it and just kind of push everything over to the side. And then every time they moved, like I said, they would collect the bones and move them. Um, sometimes they would even take the bones and share them. So if you had somebody you loved, somebody would take one arm and somebody would take another arm literally and put bury it in their house. Um, so they had this really intimate relationship with all of their ancestors. They also used lime every year. They redid their walls with lime. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure, but I think lime might be help to reduce decay. And I sometimes wonder if they didn't throw lime into those garbage mittens. And those were some questions I would ask archaeologists. Next slide. Ancestor worship. Love it. Yeah. Ancestor worship. And this is just their house. This is like a way they would might store their food and they made little look at that's a little salt shaker that they made. There's some really nice pottery that happened. Um, originally, they cooked in baskets with hot stones and then um, they started to do pottery um, like 6,500 years ago. And then we see it's very simple pottery, but next slide. This is a doorway. Um, a lot of times they would bury their people under the lintel of the doorway. Next slide. Uh, here's another. Uh, they would go, uh, the, sometimes the houses were joined one to the next, to the next, to the next. Next. So interesting. And this is the size of the doorways with my friend Rebecca here. And so each of these houses, actually you can see that the light from the uh, rooftop is shining on the wall there. You see that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I was thinking that the lime is needed to bring light into these spaces. And that ladder goes to the only entrance, which is also the smoke hole. And that is the oven um, right there that they might uh, bake in or to use to keep warm. So the smoke hole is the entrance and exit. And when people first discovered the site in 1960s, that late, um, not discovered, but began to excavate it. Um, right. Yeah, then um, they were just amazed that, oh, everybody goes in through the top. Well, I believe that they were following a lot of other societal development of the day of people like in Cappadocia and other people in the area were living underground or in caves. So I think that they were recreating a cave-like dwelling. Well, and then you're, you're so right when you say that it, it just screams Native American. We've all been to so many Native American sites and they look so similar. Nice. Um, but then, and then you, you've got this, this proportional thing again with the deer on the left next to Rebecca. And what is that? A huge cat tormenting people in the far wall where, where the, the, the light's coming in. Is, is this because in the shamanic world, that's what rules? There is goddesses that look like that? Why, why are the proportions so exaggerated that would in indicate it was archetypal and if you go to like peru for example when i went to the temple of the moon they call it it's also the temple of snake is its real name at um sesco um that they, they they you know the the llama opening is huge you know the mm -hmm. shape of the llama opening the snakes that go into the building are like or that go into the cave are like you know 
six feet long. I mean, they are saying this is a great effort. And also we think about it tormenting. Maybe they're not tormenting. Maybe they're giving vision. Maybe they're giving wisdom. Maybe the size indicates not the fear, but the love or the grandeur or the generosity of the creature. Yeah. I, I don't see any fear in those images. Mm-hmm. It's they're, they're revering. They're oh. celebrating rejoicing yeah we see something similar though very very stylized differently in um the cretan and greco roman but because they will personify an animal and then have a little tiny priestess on the hand for example you Mm. know so this could be something similar like this is our great teacher and we are here celebrating or dancing around them i don't know i just always like to try and turn things into what's practically makes sense in my body you know yeah. So yeah. next next slide. Okay, this is your slide that you love so much, but this Oh, I love this. This indicates this early relationship with the lions and this center post is actually a plastered beam of support. Um, underneath this beam, sometimes they would bury a skull of maybe an ancestor. Um, again, this was egalitarian. It was not ruled by women, but was ruled by elder groups of people it probably, you know, um, each, 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 each council or each section of people might have an elder person that speaks for them. That's the other thing that they said about that symbol of Chalhai, of the goddess um, Chabele is that it's always an older woman. That's not a young woman's body. Those are some drapey boobs. That is a sagging belly. That butt sags way down when you see images of it. So they're not talking about some young thing but there's always a pair of lions with her. And also like we talk about in that Inanna de Muzi poem, she talks mm. about the man as my lion. Yes, yeah, that, that is so good. That is so good. And I love this image and I, I couldn't help it, but just get in at the last moment and add, it's not the only image of the ancient world that portrays lions protecting, worshiping, venerating a pillar. And a pillar is, old Saxon for um, uh, Irmansoul. And we get into these, what's an Irmansoul? And it ties back to bees and goddesses. And and so a pillar is just not an arbitrary thing that the lions are venerating and protecting. Uh, it's, it's an image I think that we have forgotten that represents the goddess. Yes, and potentially the joining of um, the underworld, the middle world and the heavens. You know, like this is a place, a conduit where the heavens enter the normal space. You know, this is is the, this holds the energy from as above, so below kind of. And then also when there were female rulers, she may have more than one husband, just like that poem. She says, my lion, well, she may have two lions. I mean, it would not be uncommon, I believe, to have more than one husband. I mean, why not? You know, if it's a person who is ruling and there's reference to that in some of that old literature. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you just hear a little bit more of the drawing, you know, um, again, running around, you see that some of the figures are headless. That may be um, because the, they also see, I think that some of these are tracking families, like maybe, the spots mean something or maybe the grouping like everybody in like they're keeping track in that house for example um you know like who came through here what families were here what's the story oh yeah these six guys were running around and there was that mama deer and all those baby deer or whatever you know they might be actually telling a great story about that family or something and again we don't know what's missing um, you know, in terms of the time. Uh, yeah, thousands, thousands of years ago. And th- this is a individual home we're looking at. Yeah. And every home, every single home has these types of drawings, every single home. Uh, and most of the homes will uh, have a boar, a bull, a bear, and a, um, a deer and leopard. And these are, there's it, the main reference, the main Anchor points of the civilization's self-knowledge is wild animals. And even though they're domestic, most of the images are about wild animals and also ancestry and eldership. What, 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 sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, what if these images, I, 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 was, I was taken when you were mentioning 
all the animal types. And as you mentioned, you know, the bear and the deer and the lion, I'm just thinking that how common and pronounced they are as power animals. Yes, yes, yes. Well, people always love those big power animals. They actually overhunted the wild game by 8,000. So there was very little wild game by the time that these images were drawn. But, but I mean, I mean, spiritual power animals. Right, spiritual power animals. And yeah. also, if we think about the relationship with, like, they, these people were just moving and away from hunter-gatherer. It took a couple hundred years, um, which is really quick in human development, but just took a couple hundred years to transition from the Neolithic to the, what do they call it, Chal Chalcolithic or something like that, the Clothonic. Chalconic, I can't remember how to spell it, but no, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. Right, the fancy word yeah. for copper age. Yes. Yeah, yeah. copper age. So it was only a few hundred years, and um, so these folks were, um, you know, so if they over this, if this place had been um, formed around eight to nine thousand BCE, and they realized that it had been overhunted by 8,000 BCE, that means that this civilization had a period of time when they hunted them out and they may have been crying, trying to say, we're calling you. I mean, there may have been a thing like, this is who we are. We're the people that hunt the deer. And so we're calling on the deer and the deer is a great big animal. We love you and come back. You know what I mean? Like calling on the species to return you know, um, but at the same time, they're moving away from wild game and into um, animal husbandry. So there's a tender relationship about identity and about, you know, their gods. I mean, if the, all the way up until now, their gods are these animals, and now they're moving into agriculture and animal husbandry, you know, they're, they're, telling, the, they're telling the story of this shift somehow. And, and, and we've got the real... Um, a lot of variants, uh, some variants in the images, uh, but the common denominator is that bow-shaped thing around the waist. Yeah, and and I think about that as uh, later on in Gre Greek history, the Artemisian goddesses, the Artemisian goddess, her priestesses would be initiated publicly by wearing a golden bear robe. Well, what if the women wore the golden bear and the men wore the leopard? And back in this day, there were so many leopards they, that you could become a man and hunt one of the leopards until they ran out of them. Um, and that was the same thing with the bears. The bears were actually conserved by the Artemisian temples two or 3000 years ago in Eastern Europe, but they were nearly killed because so many people in Greece were trying to do this ritual. So I just think that's an interesting, was this something that they earned? That's why I was saying in that bull picture how the man was naked and then there was the piece of the leopard skin between the horns. Did that man earn the right to wear his leopard skin? And then are these people with the different tools saying, these are the singers? These are the, you know, this is the musician. This is a sistrum. That's a sound maybe that thing makes. I don't know. I'm just trying to push away from hunting scene and into. I really like that. I, I think that is really good. It's, it, it, it's a, a uniform, uh, but not just a uniform. It's a bit of regalia of achievement and accomplishment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and stature. Yeah. So let's. Fair. Let's try the next one. So here's just another one, a little more. And you can see up in the underneath the person, uh, there's a person there with a drum. Underneath. Yeah. And drumming is big time. So, and look, there's a man on the left with the, what looks like it could be a reed flute. So are these sistrums and flutes and dancing? Yeah, yeah. And not hunting at all. And just music and gorgeous. Like we're celebrating, we're beautiful. We love you, you know. Sarah absolutely and again i don't know why they're bending over i don't really understand that whole thing but might be like oh don't get me i'm scared of you kind of thing but let's keep going it's pretty cool how they um make beards on some of these guys and then you can see how this is they also say that there's more veneration that great word thank you uh for that comment lavender the um 
also they found out that sometimes there would be as many, believe it or not, 60 people buried under one of these little rooms. And the ones that had more buried people had more written, uh, more images and more bones of like uh, buffalo skulls and boar skulls and stuff like that. So it could, I believe that it's a story of the people. Ancestor worship. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's that, there's that, um, there's that image that to me says, this says it all. This person is earning their leopard skin skirt. I like that a lot. Next slide. And this is what it looks like as we're come. Uh, well, this isn't my picture. I got this randomly off the internet years ago, but this is what it looks like. Keep going. This is what it looks like inside. Keep going. And this is me use holding the arms of protection of this ancient, you know, that's the regional goddess, probably after, much after this civilization. I don't know how old that is, but um, Andrew, do you remember when we were at Fintorn when all the ladies surrounded all the guys and we gave you the arms of protection and gave yeah. our, yeah. So if uh, you're a woman, I invite you at some point to stand up in this position and offer protection. You can offer it to your cat or your house or your child or your man or whatever you want to do, but try feeling that feel that stand up and feel that like i offer you my protection it's an extremely mm. powerful um, mm. I, I, we we will go so deep into this symbolism uh in a, a future episode because it, it permeates every ancient culture and people don't even recognize it for what it is it's amazing next slide um, this is that map again and again just to say that we don't know what's missing um, in terms of inks um, could have brought this whole thing into perspective. I believe this is a map of the village. And I think it's because they do leave the village periodically, our city actually, and then they come back. And so they're probably writing who, which family lives in which one to prevent people from arguing and saying, no, I thought I lived there. And one, one thing that this, this definitely looks like the mountain, this, it could be the volcano. This city is on the base of the volcano. It's shaped very much like this. And then other people are like, no, it's a leopard skin. Uh, if a leopard is the archetype and this uh, volcano maybe looks like a leopard pelt to them. It looks a bit bowed. It, it, yeah. you know, so it why doesn't would... look like a volcano. It looks, I mean, it, it's a bow. It's, it's, it's and, and, and you'd have to believe that a volcano, a living piece of mother earth is, is a conduit of the goddess. It has to be, it's alive. Yeah, and we were talking about why did so many uh, people make homes near volcanoes? And I would say thermo, uh, the thermo, hydrothermal um, properties, if there's warm water there, um, you know, uh, bathing and, you know, just the magic, the magicalness of a hot water source. But I think that, the, I think that when they're calling it, like the historians are fighting over, well, it's, it's a leopard skin. No, it's a mountain. It's like, well, no, it's both. You can call the mountain the leopard. That is the leopard mountain. Look at how it's shaped like a leopard pelt. Look at how fire comes out of its foot. You know, like, why would not that be, you know, it could be both. So like, I don't think we need to worry about it being one or the other. Like, there's no argument to me. Um, it's just how we identify. How do we identify ourselves with our space? Next yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah. And there's Rebecca to give you a, an idea of how big this place is. It's basically a stadium. Next slide. And then, um, sorry for the lame picture, but uh, uh, we were talking about the farmland there, right? And so I used my telescopic telescopic lens. I was like, Rebecca, we there's got to be bees around here. So, <laughs> so we looked we looked through my telescopic lens and um, eyeballed it and saw this way off in the distance and began this overland funny journey up and through up and down and up and down and up and down the hills until we found this nice man who could translate for us and we ended up next slide showing up and um meeting the beekeeper of the property and this what? is yeah so this is a traditional turkish hive which i love um it's stuffed with wool and it's strapped with um blankets old rugs and um plastic um to keep it the rain off of it next slide 
this is oh. the family the little girls look on the left they brought us melon and chicken and oh my god it was so good and these little kids we got to eat fruit right off the tree and these little boys and little girls we of course could be surrounded by the children um, and only the head of the father, the head of the family and the oldest uncle really were talking to us, um, plus our guide, because we're women. And that was the thing I want to say, Andrew, is you and I were both experiencing Turkey differently. I'm experiencing it as a woman, and you're experiencing it as a really tall, handsome, you know, white guy that can get around. And uh, it's just a neat, different perspective. So I got to meet these young girls who were like maybe 13, 16, who one of whom already had a little baby. So it was a, definitely a different world. And I was, I'm an oddity being that I was an agriculturalist and taught geography and so on. But I, I just have to say that that was really incredible. I mean, there were more revelations and insights there than I think I've read in, in any book that I've, I've um, um, paged through on Chattel Hewlock. I mean, that was really exciting. I think we need to challenge what is, you know, be respectful, but also understand that what we've been told is just so wrong it's it's not even close to what's true and what we feel and what we see is a much more accurate uh, appraisal of what was yeah the embodiment of the experience the embodiment of actually going there and then you'll see the references in the living culture you know mm. um it's not you know when we talk about eating goats it's not like they stopped eating goats 8,000 years ago, you know, that's still goat eating culture. Like, so there's, there's going to be these things that, that I guess as Western United States citizens, a lot of us think that's such a novel idea, but literally, you know, it's the air and soul of culture that's constantly bringing oh. us in the roots into the next, into the next. T t tell me about the, the bear, because I don't, maybe there was one photo of a bear but there's yeah. images of bears right right there's images of bears and what sometimes they look like people uh in a spread eagle kind of shape and um and they'll have a bulge around the loin area um but they're bears and they're doing it almost like a Native Americans of the coast have totem poles, what they call totem poles, you know, with the eagle and the owl and the bear and the stuff. Well, they have the same thing, but there will be a bear on the top. And then there'll be a couple bull skulls and maybe a boar skull. And then it's all underneath this buried human skull or something like that. So there is a bear reference. And I'm going to look more into that because in the future, we'll probably have to do something about bears. Yeah, yeah. bears are, you know, obviously Winnie the Pooh and, and, and the natural adversary of bees because they steal the hives. But you get um, to look at bears whose um, old English name was bee wolf. And then you go into Beowulf and... Uh, the Kalavara and bees and bears. There's so much there. Um, bears Winnie, the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh is just the, an amazing story. And that ties in with London because that's where it all happened at Regent Park's Zoo. The beast, uh, bears don't eat the honey in real life. In real life. Okay. Bears don't eat the honey. They want the brood. They want the protein. The honey is just like an uh -huh. extra special uh -huh. benny. And then the second thing is, is that bears um, actually offer a service to bees because they will claw a tree and that claw mark they'll have fungus underneath their fingernails that can get into the tree and cause spores and they also wound the tree which causes propolis so they can get the propolis to fix their hive they can get the fungus to eat the medicine so just like everything in nature what is what can kill you can also be medicine so they're not really adversaries. They're well, yes and no, right? Yes and no. I love that. I don't know where this fits, other than you know, fifteen thousand years ago, also really ancient, and 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 basically older than Gobekli Tepe and Chateau Hewitt is is the uh, the cave of the spider in, in Spain, and it shouldn't surprise us that that kind of artistry depicting the bees is not dissimilar, not a million miles away from what we saw um, with uh, the, the red dots over the volcano and, and on the, the hunter's regalia. It might be a stretch, but it's just kind of showing you in that era how they portrayed bees. Yeah, and as you showed me and our 
our guest Shep Findhorn, um, that may not be just an image of a woman gathering honey. I mean, it could be a star map and we should talk about that some other time, but that's another reference to bees, bees in space is like- Exactly, exactly. This literally could be a star map of the Pleiades. We should bring that slide set in next time. Um, or at some point, because there's another bees in space reference. Which- what I like about that is we, we can agree these are bees. Mm-hmm. But then what are these things? Huh. I would say they're still bees. I don't know why. It's, it's, um, but yeah, th- there is a. Um, there's the stars. That's where the stars. Our version of, of what this portrays, whether it's Orion or the Pleiades, we'll cover that in a future episode. So we have this amazing image. Right, but when you do a close up of it, you see that the bull is crying. There's a tear in the bull's eye. Um, and there's a, um, a male figure, or maybe a, an effeminine figure, holding the horns of consecration. But when we have more time, I can explain how I feel the bull is crying because it knows that its civilization is coming to the end. The bull is Crete. Thera erupted not one time, but three times over 90 years. And they knew from history that it was going to happen again someday. And it had started to rumble so that they show the bull as as the island. Is is the bull in Chetelhuac somehow portraying their civilization versus the volcano? They know at some point the volcano is going to come. But, the, but this this archetype of, of the animal portraying some sort of um, understanding of the, the mother goddess and of earth and uh, of a pending uh, act of the mother goddess um, on earth, on the, the community, on the island. But here you have the Mayan mythology and you have an image that's almost identical Look at the two, the, the two, I guess they're men, maybe they're not, um, but they're, they're kind of paying homage to somebody who appears to represent the Mayan bee god. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. But even in Africa, again, you really have to search in this image because it's not very, very high quality, but you have this veneration um, with a, a big animal, uh, uh, and in this case, you have what appears to be hives, honeycombs. Mm. Again, really big animals. And in the, in the Mayan mythology, you, you showed that great image of, of the bull with the tongue out. Here you have, um, you know, uh, the, the Mayan believe that, that Venus was, was a bee due to its intelligent movements. And it goes down into the, the underworld and it, it, it saves rescues the sun and saves the world and the kings of course they're kings uh right you know they 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 have their tongues out because they're they're tasting the sweet honey of prosperity do you hear that story of tasting the honey in the mythologies or is that an interpretation or is that your interpretation no that that that's actually their their um history of, right. of what it represents which is so fascinating that makes uh, complete sense to me. I love this because you, you were showing the pillar. So here you have on Kenosis again, one of the earliest references to Potina of the labyrinth, honey's dedicated to her, and this ancient sort of uh, inscription associates her with one of the earliest forms of Athena, who is an unknown bee goddess, and one of her symbols was a pillar. Oh my gosh. And so what we saw at the, the gate of the lion and what we saw in Chateau Hewick with the pillar and the two lions, it's another representation of the veneration of the goddess. It's got to be. I love What I love about this is the hair. Um, I, would yeah. like, I wonder why they have it painted as a Caucasian person. Is it Minoan? Like, I guess it's a Minoan thing. That's why it's painted so white is reference to the way they used to paint it so they're saying this is how it would have looked because they've been able to find out that a lot of these times these statues were super painted um i love that she's holding her heart and that's the other thing to remind everybody that when we're looking at these images they're done in sacred positions and those positions um rebecca knows about this she's taught me a little bit about this those positions are actually like 
power, like waste, like again, it later, after you do this one or before you do the protective one, stand there very straight and think about, you know, that shape. I mean, it's kind of reminded me, I pledge allegiance to the flag, but it's the same thing like with my heart or something about my heart. And so she's a honey goddess. It's amazing because then we see the Anahat heart chakra in the Eastern Indian traditions. I mean- the Lastly, the bull. I mean, apis is Latin, Latin means bee. We talked about Taurus is Latin for bull. Apis is the genus of the honeybee. There's a lot there. So this is just a little teaser for a future episode when we'll go deeper into bulls and bees. And of course, Cabela. Yeah, Cabela. That is where we are going to end today. And um, next time in the third episode, we will start to be talking about Cabela or Chabele or Cabele or Kubaba or Kababa or Kaba or Kuba. Uh, and, and, and again, more bees in space. And you, we are getting closer to revealing, we're releasing one veil at a time, the story of this sacred meteorite. So please join us next time. And thank you, Andrew, for today. Laura, thanks everyone. Can't wait. See you next time. Okay.